Hello, I'm Peter Oborn of Middle East Eye, uh, and for the next uh, half an hour, I'll be uh, interviewing Peter Shambrook, a very distinguished historian who's solved the Rubik Cube of the Middle East, the contents of the correspondence between the British commissioner in, in, in Egypt in, in 1915 uh, and, uh, and, Sh and Sharif Hussein in Mecca. Uh, and this correspondence is at the heart of the modern Middle East. It's what the British promised to the Arabs in return for their participation in the Arab revolt uh, against the Ottoman Empire during World War I. This is an extraordinary book. I've read every word of it. It's called Policy of Deceit, Britain and Palestine, 1914 to 39. It's an extraordinary book full of deep learning and insight, as I can testify, which completely rewrites the last hundred year years of history uh, of Britain and the Middle East. So welcome, Peter. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. First of all, this is a remarkable book. You can, I can tell you've visited so many archives. You've um, been to so many places which nobody has been before uh, intellectually. Uh, what led you to, 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 to write this book, Policy of Deceit? Well, uh, after I retired seven years ago, um, uh, I had no idea that I would write this book, uh, and certainly not that it would have, a, obviously, have such a trenchant or unambiguous title. Um, but I was uh, drawn into um, something, a charity called the Balfour Project, and they asked me to um, give a short talk, knowing my history background. They asked me to give a short talk on the alleged contradictory promises that Britain made during the First World War concerning the Middle East. And um, so I was intrigued and I, I uh, needed to investigate the details of it. And uh, the more I did investigate it, the more confused I became. Um, so I gave my talk, but I basically sat on the fence about how alleged they were or how contradictory they were. Um, but that led me into the archives. So I, I, I then went into the archives. Um, this was about uh, 2015, 2016. I went into the archives and I found myself with, uh, on the one hand, with uh, the uh, contemporary colonial office memorandum, and in my other hand, I had a combination of the uh, uh, the uh, Hansard political uh, statements that the successive governments were giving uh, and announcing and statements, and, and also the extensive uh, uh, secondary literature, and these three. Uh, elements, these three sources, basically had uh, continuous discrepancies. They were like uh, competing narratives. So it was, a <laughs> it was um, for about a year or so, my, my curiosity increased, but also my uh, confusion increased. Um, and uh, it took quite a while before I began to understand what the real game was that had been going on ever since 1914, 1915, um, and eventually clarity came. But I remember sitting in the archives, and sometimes I would feel like um, the uh, the young, fresh, uninformed English journalist who went over to Belfast in the beginning of the 1970s, and um, for a story, and he listened to a range of opinions for uh, for a week or so. Uh, and as he was leaving, he was told, well, if you are not now thoroughly confused, you have not been properly informed. So, so um, one thing led to another, and uh, it was only about uh, 18 months ago when I finished the manuscript, uh, I took a short break and then read the whole, the whole thing again um, with as much detachment as I possibly could. And uh, three or four main characteristics of British policy during this period sort of emerged out of the whole 20-year period. And one of these characteristics was, I can only describe as a consistent level of deception. Uh, and that's where the title came from. So some of the people, I'll name 
I'll name some of the people to you who uh, were guilty of this deception because they're basically some of the greatest names of English British political history. Winston yes. Churchill, yes. A.J. Balfour, yes. uh, Lloyd George. Yes. Um, and who else were? Who else are the other? Uh, uh, well, culprits? there was a whole raft of them. Uh, there was Bona Law. There was uh, yes, Churchill. There was um, there was uh, Lord Curzon. Uh, he, he wasn't that keen on the Zionist uh, homeland project, but nevertheless, he went along with it. Um, so yes, they 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 all made. They either they either lied or they made misleading statements. Yeah, indeed, it's they, a combination they, uh, of all yeah, kinds of things. Yeah, it was in very familiar territory. This we have <laughs> as leading British uh, politicians lying about the Middle East, and of course it has anybody who studies the current Middle East as I do is very familiar with that situation. Uh, indeed, I've, I'm a student of the remarks made by the current Foreign Secretary James Cleverly, and it's he's full of uh, deception and, and misleading statements and. Um, let's just sort of, before we get to the core of your book, uh, just describe the situation which existed in 1914-15 uh, when we, ahead of this correspondence which is at the heart of your book between, um, uh, between uh, the British High Commissioner in, in, in Cairo and the, and the Macha, and the Sharif in Macha. Well, um, the context here is incredibly important. The context was the great powers, uh, various alliance systems were, were, uh, fell into war in uh, August 1914. And um, for the previous 200 years or so, great powers had um, bargained among themselves about what they would do if they won the war and how they would carve up and deal with uh, the buffer states or the defeated empires or, or whatever it is. So, so uh, making promises to allies was, was a part of the normal game. Um, so when the war started, um, the, 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 the first uh, thing, uh, once the Ottomans uh, came into the war in November 1914, the British, the French and the Russians, who were allies, they got together and they uh, negotiated a uh, uh, what they call the Constantinople Agreement and this agreement was basically that uh, the British and the French accepted that the Russians could take Constantinople and the Straits the French would take uh, Syria that is uh, La Syrie, uh, La Syrie Antigral, the whole of the whole of uh, from Aleppo the Eastern, to Damascus, from Aleppo, out to uh, well, all the way down to the Hejaz, all the way yeah. down to Egypt, yeah, uh, right, right, the whole of the right. eastern side of the Mediterranean, yeah. uh, gr Greater Syria, what we call, it. and and the British, of course, <laughs> said uh, their agreement was that well, we will um, we will take any part of the Ottoman Empire, uh, you know, according to how the chips fall at, at the end of hostilities. So, so they're basically, they are assuming they're going to win the war. Yes. And, and they're carving up yes. the Ottoman Empire yes. and the Caliphate, of course, yes. yeah. between well, them, as it were. Well, well, the Ottoman Empire, basically, yes. The Caliphate was another element in the whole design. Um, but uh, but uh, the, the, the famous quote, which a lot of historians use, and which is absolutely true, is that uh, one of the military uh, senior officers in the British Army uh, is quoted, he wrote, that we seem to have divided up the bear's skin while the bear is still alive. Yes. So that was, that was part of it. So the and then, of course, this um, setback occurs, doesn't it? You get the, um, the Gallipoli offensive. Yes. That's, meant, that's Churchill's uh, brainchild. Yeah. It's meant to... Um, take, take, take the Turks, the Ottomans, out of the war. Absolutely. That uh, was and, the, and Britain gets, and the, uh, Britain and the Allies get defeated. Uh, uh, yes, yes. So the, the Allies retreat. Humiliatingly defeated. They retreat. I mean, the idea was to knock the Ottomans out of the war so the Brits and the British Empire and the French could then concentrate on the, on the, uh, you know, on the Western Front uh, and, and so on. And that didn't, yes, that didn't work. So. So the British and the French and the Russians were, were, were looking around. They were all looking around, and the Ottomans were as well, and the Germans. They were all looking around for potential allies or at least to neutralize potential enemies to get as many as they Everybody wanted to, everybody, every participant in the war wanted 
to gain a strategic edge over their enemies. To win the war was the key thing. So um, the Ottomans, of course, had, and the Caliph in Constantinople, they had issued a jihad once they had come into the war in November 1914. They issued a jihad uh, uh, encouraging the whole of the Muslim world to rise against the Allies. Uh, and uh, this caused considerable concern in Paris and in London because, uh, for instance, in India, there were 400,000 uh, Muslim troops. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the loyalty of the Indian army, you know, was in question. And the French, of course, and there were, uh, we had Egypt as well and so on. So, and the French had uh, a lot in North Africa and, and so on. Uh, French troops who were actually uh, Muslim and so on. So, um, uh, so that is why, fundamentally, that is why the British then turned to the Sharif of Mecca in order to cajole him, to encourage him to, um, to uh, rebel against the Ottomans. Uh, but they needed to offer him something um, because they thought that if the Sharif um, uh, uh, joins the British, it will undercut the uh, Ottoman call to jihad because the Sharif was the most senior religious uh, figure uh, as the Emir of, uh, of and the Sharif of Mecca. Uh, the, um, was he more senior than the Caliph? Uh, he was the most senior Muslim uh, figure in, in Mecca, uh, which, you know, I can't uh, exaggerate the importance yes, of Mecca of course, to, yeah, yeah. To, uh, to, uh, to the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. um, so so, so as, one, as one historian and, said... And the, the Caliph the, issued a, he issued a jihad against, yes, against, against the, the Allies, against and, the and, British. And, 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 they, and they, the Brits managed to get the... Sharif to issue a, a jihad against the... No, no, no. He never no, did that. No, no, no but, but, but what he did was he opened, through his sons, he opened negotiations with the British. The British basically offered the Sharif an independent Arab state or states uh, if he, uh, at the end of the war, if they won the war, uh, uh, with the proviso or, or on condition that uh, he and his Hijazi uh, people would um, would um, revolt against the Ottomans, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and he kept his side of the bargain, mm -hmm. um, and we didn't. Right. Let's now get to the heart of your book. So you've you've painted a picture where the, the the Brits and the the Brits are desperate to get the Arabs on side uh, to fight, to join their their war against yes. the Germans and the Turks, and. Um, they're having to make promises to the, mo the, the most holy figure in Islam, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who is the Sharif in Mecca. Uh, and the, the, the commissioner, the high commissioner in Egypt is McMahon at the time. And they, there's a, a long, this is what you have done. You've, uh, uh, you have analyzed the correspondence mm. between the the, the, the High Commissioner and the Sharif and analyse what was promised by the British. Mm. Uh, and perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that correspondence. Uh, well, the, uh, the High Commissioner, Sir Henry McMahon, was uh, officially uh, designated to speak on behalf of the British government. He was not just speaking for himself mm. or as the High Commissioner in Cairo. Uh, and there were ten letters altogether exchanged between them, five, five each way. Uh, all the letters were in Arabic. Um, and, uh, uh, and the uh, Sharif laid out geographically the exact, exact extent of the uh, independent state or states that he wanted. Uh, and to keep the story brief, um, the, the, uh, the High Commissioner um, agreed to that area with two reservations and uh, these two reservations are explicitly stated in the the key letter which is that of the 24th of October 1915 and uh, where uh, McMahon lays out these reservations and the key reservation was a paragraph which said this portions of Syria to the west of the districts of Damascus, Homs, Hama, and Aleppo must be reserved from 
the area uh, designated for the sheriff. And um, uh, and the, the, if, you, if you look at the uh, map, because everybody looks at maps, the, ho the whole of the war was, you know, the, all the decision makers, military people, you look at a map. If you have a mental picture of a, a map of the eastern Mediterranean there, um, uh, the, uh, these four districts of uh, Damascus, Homs, Hammer, Hammer and Aleppo um, could only mean linguistically could only mean the uh, local city districts of Damascus, Homs, Hama and Aleppo. Mm -hmm. What the British did uh, in 1920... Let's just pause you there very because, briefly, beca because Brett pause you there, uh, and the, the districts, to, and we are saying we don't, we're not including in our promise to you the, the areas to the, to the west, of, which is basically modern day Lebanon, is it not? Correct, yes. correct, okay. And, and uh, for, from 1915 through to 1920, British officials, including McMahon, uh, Arnold Toynbee, General Maxwell, who was the head of the army in uh, Egypt. Arnold Toynbee was one of the greatest, went on to become yes. one of the great historians of the 20th century, by the way. Quite, not, he, yeah. was, he was a junior official in the, yeah. intellig in the uh, sort of foreign office at, at that point, just at the end of the war. Uh, and also Lord Curzon, who was a kind of acting foreign secretary under, uh, sort of under Balfour at the end of 1918. Um, they all interpreted the correspondence correctly. Okay, so, so there were eight or nine written documents from these leading figures where, the, where it was quite clear, and they, they said quite clearly that it was this Lebanon region that had been reserved by McMahon. And not, and, crucially, therefore, Palestine underneath. Uh, exactly. It was, it was the, what they call the northern coastal areas of Syria. And in fact, um, if you go right back to October 1915, McMahon sent an explanatory uh, letter back to the Foreign Office explaining uh, the description of, of, uh, of his letter to the Sharif. And he says in, in the letter back to the Foreign Office, I have, res in his, I'm paraphrasing here, but in essence, I have reserved the northern coasts of Syria. The northern coast of Syria. Now, if you look at the map, by no stretch of the imagination is Palestine or, or the Sanjak of Jerusalem uh, part of the northern coast of Syria. So what the British did then in 1920 mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, uh, was uh, to claim that the district of Damascus in the correspondence mm -hmm. was actually the province of Damascus and the boundary, the southern boundary of the province of Damascus, they said, uh, extended southwards for 300 miles all the way to the Gulf of Aqaba. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they, British basically claimed that the, that there was there was a province of Damascus which which went all the way down to Aqaba, uh, and that the, the whole of the region to the west of that province of Damascus was was reserved. Well, the problem for that uh, is that there never was a province of Damascus. If you look on the Ottoman maps, and the British had all the maps, all the Ottoman maps, they knew exactly what... Uh, well, those maps would have okay. been on the wa walls of the war office, they'd have been yes. out there in... in, in with Alan, in, Allenby would have it, had them as he came it, into Jerusalem. Eventually, yes, yeah. he, he would. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so, so what, what there was, uh, there was a, uh, um, uh, not a district of Damascus, uh, not a province of Damascus, but there was a province of Syria. The Ottoman province of Syria went all the way down north, north of Damascus, but also all the way down south to the Gulf of Aqaba. And it was called, and everybody knew, and the McMahon, and they all knew that it was the, the province in Turkish, it was called the Vilayet of, of uh, Syria. So, and uh, this interpretation of uh, that... Uh, that the district of Damascus in the correspondence could only mean the province of Syria or the province of Damascus um, was uh, taken up by Churchill in his white paper and it became the rock-solid uh, explanation 
uh, of the British exclusion of Palestine all the way up to 1939. So the fabrication, it's a fabrication. Absolutely. They, uh, the, the, uh, the promise, it appears in the white paper, it's part of what Churchill, how he explains it. Yes. Now what had happened, so the British said, say one thing in 1915, and it, yes. let's just pause with, with that. That is a official acting with the full power of the British state, McMahon, the High Commissioner in Egypt. He's say, sending a letter making commitments uh, to the most senior religious figure in Islam, that is, that's a legally, legally binding document. It's a treaty, isn't it? Uh, it's, technically, it is not a treaty, mm -hmm. if you want to um, mm -hmm. <laughs> be technical about it. A treaty, even in the 19th century, in a sense, treaties were agreements between recognized sovereign independent mm -hmm. states. And, uh, but at the same time, the, the word treaty was used quite loosely in, in the documents and in the British documents. So, for instance, even in the correspondence between the, the uh, McMahon and Hussein and the Sheriff Hussein, McMahon speaks in the correspondence, in, the, in his correspondence, uh, about the treaties we have with the Arab sheikhs in the Gulf. So he uses that. And these are 19th century treaties that the British made with various uh, sheikhs, uh, 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 and at, at, at no point did the British uh, question the, the use of, uh, of treaty with these Arab sheikhs, who were not were not independent sovereign states. Um, so the, the the word treaty is was used very loosely. But if if we move on to other declarations and agreements and uh, so on that the British made during the war. Um, for instance, uh, the next one after, the, after this correspondence of um, uh, 1915, it finished in March 1916, uh, the British then <coughs> told the French about it, sort of, uh, and, um, and then Sykes and Pico, as you know, then came to an agreement. So the British and the French then came to an agreement. Um, <coughs> and uh, this was uh, an interstate I would call it a treaty, it's called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, but it was, uh, it was uh, basically a treaty and um, it was <coughs> um, done as an exchange of letters between the British Foreign Secretary, Edward Grey, and the, and the, uh, uh, and the French um, Foreign Secretary, uh, Monsieur Campbell. Okay, it was an exchange of letters. Uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, the uh, correspondence, Hussein McMahon correspondence, was, was also an exchange of letters. Um, and um, so technically you can stand on your point of view and say it, 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 the Hussein McMahon uh, w was not a treaty. But in, 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 in practice, all the, all the promises and declarations and statements that, that the British made um, had a variety of a mix of sort of moral and political uh, implications and um, um, you know for instance the, the Balfour Declaration was not in any way uh, a treaty it was a, a statement of intent there were not two parties involved officially uh, although it's a, the, the uh, right. Balfour Declaration was well, a... Let's compare and contrast then the Balfour okay. Declaration and the, yeah. uh, the agreement or the treaty between the British uh, and the Arabs Yes. Of course, the Balfour Declaration takes place in, is made in 1917 yes. by, uh, by, by a British Foreign Secretary. Yes. Uh, and that uh, makes this famous statement about a Jewish homeland mm -hmm. in, in what is today Palestine, or was then, sorry, Palestine. Yes. And. It, and it's today many people would see the same thing, but it's so he makes that uh, declaration. Yes. Well, and that it is about that area which the British had already promised, as, as this is right, is it to the to the Arabs, uh, to the Sharif Hussein. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and yet, and yet, or you're saying that the Balfour Declaration was less legally binding. It was just a sort of statement of intent. I think, it, I think, it's, I think it's arguable. It's yeah. arguable that it, was, that it has uh, less uh, serious legal 
obligations than the correspondence with Hussein and McMahon. Um, and was the and when you look at the British suddenly reinterpreting or inventing yes. um, parts of the treaty which hadn't which were fabricated, yes. British fa this happens in 1920. Are the British in your are they fabricating this province of Damascus in order to find a way of accommodating the Balfour Declaration? In the in, in the in the post-war order of things, i.e., a, a, a Jewish homeland. Um, yes, one needs to understand the process of what was going on here in in the Middle East as well as in the corridors of power in Paris and, and, and in London. The British and the Zionist organisation, uh, uh, post the declaration at the end of 1917, um, carried on negotiating, and so. From, from the beginning of 1919, after the war, uh, the British and the Zionist organization were uh, negotiating a, a, a mandate document uh, for, the, for the governance of, of Palestine. At the same time, um, one has to understand what was happening in, in, in uh, Jerusalem with Allenby and everything else, and uh, with Faisal, because eventually what happened is uh, Faisal was um, uh, ejected from ejected from uh, um, uh, Damascus in King, in, King Faisal. Was he, uh, was he the son of Sharif Hussein? Yes, he was the third son of uh, the Sharif. Right. Yes, yeah. yes. So he was uh, he, he was um, in July 1920. He was uh, basically ejected from Damascus, but he was still in some ways a, a friend and an ally and a protege of the British. Um, and so the British had to do something with, with Faisal. So you've done something very uh, bold in your book. Until now, the general view among his respected historians, Kaduri and, uh, and Friedman, has been that the British position was correct. That generally speaking, we did give, uh, we did separate Palestine, what is today Israel Strait Palestine, from the deal with the uh, uh, w w with the Sharif, or at the, at the very least, they just sort of say it's too too difficult to say. And you said no, it's absolutely unambiguous uh, that the Brits lied, basically betrayed the sh the Sharif. Um, wh why how, why why did Kurdiri and Friedman and Martin Gilbert and so many others, very eminent and distinguished historians? Get it wrong. Well, those three gentlemen that you've just <coughs> mentioned, they're all dead now. So just quite what went on in their minds, I don't know. They made a they made a variety of they made a variety of uh, assumptions and everything. They, uh, I would say that um, I would say that uh, Isaiah Friedman who was an a Israeli professor at uh, Ben-Gurion University. Uh, I would say he was, his scholarship was quite uh, unreliable, let's put it like that. Um, Kaduri was more, Eli Kaduri, who was a very distinguished uh, Zionist uh, professor at the LSE, uh, who, he wrote about 19 books, I think, mm -hmm. or something. He, <coughs> very distinguished, he, famous man. Yeah. Famous man, uh, but he, um, he, he was more, intellectually uh, uh, implicit in his uh, diagnosis of the, of the whole thing. But basically both of them said, either implicitly or explicitly, that there was no double dealing or almost no double dealing by the British uh, on, on, all of this, uh, on all of this issue. Uh, my thesis is, having looked at the same documents as Kaduri and uh, Isaiah Friedman from, from all the source records in their books, uh, uh, I think uh, my thesis is that the evidence, both textual of the correspondence and contextual, um, looking at the colonial office records uh, from 1920 all the way through to 1939, um, uh, is, is overwhelming. That the British knew, they knew that uh, they were in denial about, about the fact that Palestine had been promised to the Sharif. And that is the reason 
That is the reason why between 1920 and 1939, because I went through every single day of parliamentary sittings from June 1916 to December 1939, mm -hmm. and I pulled out all the references to Palestine. It's one and a half million words. And during that period, during that 20 year period, the British government spokesman, either the colonial secretary or the government front bench spokesman, categorically refused to uh, publish the Hussein McMahon correspondence. And they always said, they had a variety of arguments, but they always said it would not be in the public interest to do so. But the internal documents are very, very clear when they're discussing among themselves, they knew that their case was absolutely weak as jelly and that a debate, a parliamentary debate about the correspondence uh, would make them look ridiculous. That was the word they used. It will make us look ridiculous if we allow uh, a discussion about the McMahon pledge. And that continued all the way. So 24 times they, the British government officially refused to publish the correspondence. It was only in 1939. So yes, explain to me why it's on 24 separate occasions yes. they're asked to publish yes. this correspondence. Yes. Um, two questions. First of all, why didn't the Sharif or the, why, why didn't the Arabs publish? Um, they did. Oh, they did? Yes. Yeah. Yes, the, uh, the, the, the Sharif published excerpts of the correspondence. Excerpts, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, and including the uh, October 24 letter of 1915. Uh, and uh, the correspondence had also, so it had appeared in the Arab press from time to time. Mm. In 1923, JMN Jeff Jeffries, an English or Irish uh, journalist, writer, he had published uh, some of the uh, 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 correspondence in articles in the Daily Mail. And then in 1938, George Antonius had uh, published. George Antonius was an Egyptian Lebanese uh, um, uh, scholar and um, he worked uh, during the mandate. He worked in the education department during the mandate. Uh, and in 1939, he was the general secretary of the Arab delegation to the St. James's Conference in London, which was all about the future of, of Palestine. He was a trilingual, honorable, discerning uh, Arab scholar. And he wrote a famous book called The Arab Awakening, which was published in 1938. And he included eight of the, eight of the letters of the correspondence at the end of his book as an appendix, because in 1931, he had gone to Amman uh, and he had uh, talked with the Sharif just before he died. And the Sharif had given him the original correspondence and, uh, uh, and uh, George Antonius had uh, copied this out, uh, you know, the original stuff. So, so the only thing that was missing was the British government's official acceptance that, yes, this is the correct correspondence. Yeah. That was what was missing and that was what, what the Arab world wanted the British to put on the table yeah. in 1939 when they came to London to discuss the future of Palestine. And why did, yeah, and why, what was it about 1939? I can think of one pretty big reason. Well, but after 24 t times turning down the opportunities to publish this correspondence, finally yes. we do this, the Brits do this in 1939. Why do they do it then? Because, context again, yeah. uh, war clouds around Europe developing, okay? Um, and um, so the British priorities at the time, at the beginning of 1939, were quite clear. They weren't stated publicly necessarily, but they were quite clear. Uh, one was to uh, completely suppress and finish off the Arab revolt in Palestine to extinguish the, the Arab revolt in Palestine because the British still had 20,000 troops and the RAF tied up in Palestine and with a possible war, European war, they needed the troops to be released for the defence of Egypt and the Suez Canal and the, and the, uh, the High Commissioner in Cairo was, was, was uh, asking for, for more and more, more troops. Um, because Mussolini was not f too far away from uh, from the you know from Egypt, so so that was the main the, the, the main thing was the main thing was uh, uh, the uh, 
the, um, the need to release troops, the need to extinguish the, the Palestine uh, revolt. And the other big contextual issue is that basically the, the priority for the uh, government was strategically to maintain the security of the imperial uh, communications to the east. In other words, protection of the Suez Canal in particular. So they did not want the whole of that Middle East area uh, to go against them at the beginning of the war, if there was going to yeah. be a war. They didn't want a repeat of the First World War. And MacDonald, Malcolm MacDonald, the colonial secretary, was told by the military chiefs that if the Arab world goes against us in this coming war, we may well lose the war. So it, it, given that context, uh, Malcolm MacDonald realized that uh, when the conference, uh, St. James Conference started about the, discussing the future of Palestine with the, with the Arab world on one side and the Zionist organization, the World Zionist organization on the other and, and the Brits in the middle, um, there in, in London in February 1939, uh, the Brits realized that they needed to basically somehow placate a little bit anyway the Arab world to keep them if not as allies, to keep them uh, well enough on side that they didn't join Hitler and Mussolini. Um, and uh, when the Arab world, including some Palestinians, came to London for the conference, one of the first things they put on the table for discussion was the correspondence. And so the British agreed to discuss the correspondence, but they didn't want to do it around a table. They said to the Arabs, you put together a memo, a written memo about it, and we'll, we'll uh, look at it, and we will send you back a written memo. Uh, it would have been too embarrassing to have had face-to-face -face discussions because they would have just... It would, Eaten them yeah. alive. Yes, yes. So that, that was basically 1939. So they set up this committee, uh, and to cut a long story short, the committee it did issue a, a joint report, but they agreed to disagree. So the, the Arabs uh, kept, uh, maintained their position that Palestine had been promised to the Sharif because they had four meetings. Um, and the British, under the chairmanship of the uh, uh, Lord Chancellor, Frederick Maugham, uh, Brother of the novelist Somerset Maugham, I seem to recall. Yeah. Correct. Uh, they held to the British position that Palestine was excluded from the promise. Um, but the internal documents show that uh, Maugham didn't actually believe what he was saying. And internally, uh, he, he called the British case straw. Um, and the colonial secretary uh, uh, summed up the Anglo-Arab uh, joint uh, report by saying um, to his colleagues internally, um, we have let the boar touch one stump without removing the bales. That was his comment about the report. Yeah. So you've established um, that the British uh, absolutely misled uh, the Sharif of Mecca in, uh, in 1915 and went on lying about it for ages afterwards. This is a, a breach of well, promise. Well, they, they, they misled, they misled officially uh, from about 1920, in yeah, a sense. Yeah. Yes. And, and at the end of the book, you have quite an eloquent passage when you say we need to, we Britain, need to put this right. What do you, what do you think we should do now to, 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 uh, to mend this crime, uh, this broken uh, promise, this act was, of it, deceit? It's, it's certainly a broken promise. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's no doubt about that. We, 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 uh, the, the sheriff and his sons and their troops did what the best they could to, to fulfill their side of the bargain, and we didn't. We reneged on it, and, and uh, I think we need to be honest about this. I think after a hundred years, it's time for our country to acknowledge this hidden part of our policy during this period. Um, my own conviction is that, the, that uh, uh, an acknowledgement um, of our past history, honesty about our past history, um, does not, uh, the, the significance of it does not diminish with the passage of time. Um, 
and whether it's a uh, anyway so uh, whether it's a personal uh, um, acknowledgement or a, a national acknowledgement um, I, personally I don't I don't advocate um, public apologies unless they're absolutely heartfelt because uh, I've known a number of uh, other national sort of apologies w which have been more a political um, public relations exercise to try and soften other peoples up uh, in various parts of uh, the world. So, so uh, I don't advocate a, just a, a simple, because I think it, it's much deeper than that. Trust building is much deeper than that on an individual level and on a, on a national level. And um, without acknowledgement, there is no, there is no trust what, whatsoever. And we British have never acknowledged this particular issue. Um, so, so I think an acknowledgement would be uh, appropriate. Um, of course, you then move on to the whole question, which is uh, increasingly happening with the British Empire and slavery and everything about accountability and reparations and everything else like that. Uh, I don't have great points of view about all of that, but all I do know is we made this broken promise. And as Toynbee said, uh, whether or not it was a treaty is uh, irrelevant in the sense that we made a firm promise. And when Lord George, as Prime Minister, was negotiating with Faisal in September 1919, he described the Hussein McMahon correspondence as a firm promise by the British. Um, and uh, so, so I think acknowledgement of, of, of this firm promise and the fact that it was broken is, is, is important. And uh, later, um, Arnold Toynbee, who was a magnificent um, uh, uh, scholar of uh, international repute and in terms of international relations and power politics and all this kind of thing, great power politics, he said that the correspondence, far from being a minor footnote in history, was the spark that has lit the Middle East ever since. That was, uh, that was, I'm paraphrasing him, but that basically he said it was a spark that has lit the fire of the Middle East uh, ever since. So, just to I'm quote you, at the very, just to quote what, your own words at the end of this book, because we must wrap now, sadly. Okay. Could acknowledgement, unimaginable at present, be one of the initial stepping stones towards a potential new dispensation for the region? Or must the war for Palestine continue for another century? Yes. And my point is that uh, it's for the British government to uh, acknowledge. You know, that, that's where we need to start. We need to start with ourselves, not point the finger from the height of our moral mountain, self-imposed moral mountain, pointing the finger at other people. We need to start with ourselves. And that's what I hope the book has done for me anyway personally it's very powerful thank you very much for speaking to me thank you thank you peter